Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin continue our study as we lay judges on a line. Can we begin with a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this morning. We are thankful for your care through the night. We are thankful, Lord, for uh, the way that you have led us through the day. We ask for your presence to continue to be with us as we study together, as we uh, open your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and help us to understand the things that we are reading. We ask this, Lord, so that we can uh, see clearly our need of you and how you are leading in our lives, in this movement and in the events around us. Be with each person, particularly in the struggles that they have and their day-to-day -day decisions. And be with us as we study together here. Unite our hearts and our minds to you and to one another. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. So uh, Dwight had sent me a document, which I got a chance to see this morning. Um, where he puts together all the scripture verses addressing 300. And so I'll put this up here on the screen. Now, all of these verses aren't necessarily relevant to our understanding of the 300 um, that we're looking at in the story of Gideon. Now, uh, yesterday, just when we had, had finished, we had addressed um, that Ellen White refers to the um, uh, to the ones, the the 276 people that are on the ship in the book of Acts, chapter 27, as 300. So she rounds it up. Um, and so we're making a suggestion that the 273 and the 300 share some kind of symbolism together. At least that was the suggestion that we had. Um, uh, we also addressed just really briefly, the 300 foxes that Samson had caught and uh, tied together with the torches between them. And um, so what we're doing here is we're just looking at other verses that deal with 300. So some of them we're just going to skim through. I mean, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. So this would be the first mention now, of course, we know the connection of Enoch to this movement, right? So you have Enoch, who he lives for 365 years. So that first 65 years before Methuselah is born, uh, we have as a symbol that comes from the prophetic mirror. Uh, but we also know after Methuselah is born, he's going to live 187 years before he begets Lamech. And so, so we have this uh, 65 and 187, which together is 252, a symbol of course of the 2520. So we have all of these symbols tied together. But now we also, if we think about it, we also have 300 years tied to those symbols. And and we have 300 years here in the story of Gideon. And I, I don't think we really thought about it much when we were dealing with um, uh, the chronology addressing that 252 years. And when we, we have the 252 days from November 9th, 2019, here, I'm going to draw this on the board. I think this will be interesting to people and much easier to see.
Stop the share here, just hang on. <clears throat> I'm going to erase this. I'll end up drawing this again. <clears throat> so, in our lines, we have, of course, November 9th, 2019. 252 days later, we have July 18, 2020. And another 250 days later, we have March 27th, 2021. And then 270 days later, we have December 25th, 2021. <clears throat> now, we know that this is a period of 777 days. And that's connected to Lamech. So Lamech lives for 777 years. So if we were to put Enoch here, the 65, and Methuselah here, the 187, um, you'd have 252 here as well. Now, um, what, were, what were the dates here? Um, if somebody remembers, I did. I, uh, I know there was a. It, we didn't mark anything particularly on them, but I, I would like to look at them if somebody can bring them up. So the idea then is we also have 300 years, so 300 days from this date to some date here, which I don't know if we ever looked at. Now, we could just argue that that 300 years represents, you know, the 273 as a symbol. Um, so, Rand, can you produce those dates? Uh, I think May 6th would be um, at the beginning of the 181. Beginning here? Or 187? Um, at, beginning at the 187. Yeah, that would make sense. May 6th, 2019. And, and March 2 is the first one. Yeah. So yeah, so also 2019. Now, if I was going to go from here 300 days, that bring me to should be March something. March. It's March first of 2020. First, okay, yeah. Right, and of course you can see this is March, March 2nd, so this is 65, you obviously know, 365 days here. And because we um, uh, moved in past February, so, right, so 365 would bring us um, 360, let me see here, because you're gonna have the leap year here. So that's why it, moves from March 2nd to March 1st. I don't know if that makes sense to people, but there's a February 29th in here. Otherwise, this going from March 2nd, 365 days would bring you to March 2nd. So I don't know what this means particularly, but this is, this is what we have as far as this 300. And we can see this 300 is attached to this symbol of 65. So we know that when we have the prophetic mirror, you're going to have this 65 years at the beginning. Let's say you're going to deal with um, 742 to 677, and then you're going to have 252 or 
25, 20 years to 1844, right? And then you're going to do uh, you know, 19 years to 1863. I mean, we're all familiar with the prophetic mirror. But we know also we have a 25, 20 that goes here with the 19 years here and 65 years here. So this 65 being attached to a 252, here we have a 65 attached to a 300 as a symbol. So can we say that 300 has something to do with the message of the 2520? That's the, the idea. <clears throat> Isn't there 300 people preaching with the chart? Yeah. So we have the, the 300 people preaching with the chart, which has the 2520 on it. So, so I don't know if the dates themselves are very important, but what's important is the symbols and how they're all tied together. So it's a witness to um, the symbols that we have. Now, um, so if we're going to put all these symbols together, I mean, uh, you know, maybe we should still look at some more of these. <clears throat> so that's the first one that we have. We have Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. And, and since that's the law of first mention, we would have to look at that as sim significant. So we have 300 years. It's the symbol of 300. We can tie it to these symbols of the 252, the prophetic mirror, uh, July 18th, and the 777 structure, all here. So the fact that we have 300 in this story of Gideon would tie it to this 300. So this is, is, this, is this a symbol of the beginning of a closer probation? Simply, where, where do you see the close of probation here? Just because, I mean, I'm, you... I'm... okay, let's, as we're looking at this, you have these, you have these 300 plus what you just mentioned, as far as all of the other symbols that are being tied to it. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are comparing this verse with the one that follows it, which gives the dimensions of the ark. I'm asking if this is a symbol of the beginning, kind of like a warning message of the close of probation. Okay. Now, we know that at this point with Enoch, that Noah is not alive. He comes on the scene a few hundred years later. Yeah. But we have, we have so many symbols that are tied here with Genesis 5.22. So we've also got other symbols such as the five whys and reunion. <coughs> or restoration. Mm. also being tied with this. Yeah. So this, this one verse and the symbols that are tied to it are fairly weighty as far as, as far as what we've been considering within this movement. Yes. Yeah, to me, it's an extremely important verse. Um, well, all this connected with Enoch, um, Methuselah, and uh, Lamech. 
dealing with the symbols that we have in our movement. And, and because we, we didn't, um, you know, we, we, we didn't create these symbols. These are symbols that happened, that they all happened to come together in connection with this whole history of these three uh, patriarchs. And, 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 and to me, it's always interesting of how it all came together, how we, how we came up with the symbol of Lamech attached to the 777. It had nothing to do with any setting of dates or July 18 or anything like that. Uh, that was done long before when I was simply studying the uh, 70 weeks and noticing the two Lamechs and, and the idea that 434 and 343 um, added together created this 777, which is the length of Lamech's life. All these things, all these symbols, the 65, the 252, none of them had to do anything with setting of the date for July 18. But after we had these structures, then we um, uh, could see that these things were all connected. And as Stephen notes here, um, we have uh, the word value for Enoch is 65. That's if you just add it, right? So that's the normal gematria. Is So how are you doing that, Stephen? I'm not quite sure. Um, You're just taking the E for five and N for what, 14. Yeah. No, he's just added them, up, adding them, up, them up. And then when you multiply it, it's 25200. Zero, zero. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I thought. So, so Enoch uh, creates these two symbols uh, just in this, this way of using the gematria. Now, we also have, um, was noted in your tabled history, um, when we, ha we had the chart of the ages of these patriarchs, um, and I can't remember where we started, um, but if we added them together, we would get uh, 2520 as well, I believe. And that was starting with, um, if anybody remembers, when when Lamech is born or e Enoch is born, I can't remember. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, um. I think it is when Enoch is born, it's uh, the ages of the patriarchs is two, only at seven. Yeah, all, that's all of them together. But there's some point where we can go back and it's going to add up to 2520. Um, and I just can't remember where it is. Just hang on a second. I'll easily do it if I do it this way. Um. So there, there, the point that I'm trying to make here is there's these structures that exist within um, these, these um, ages of the patriarchs. So I'm going to find it here. I think it's going to start. I think there's a certain amount of them. I think uh, if you add up maybe the first five, it's, it's 25, 20. And then if you add up the next three or so it's uh, another number that sort of <coughs> something like that yeah yeah if you go from when Lamech is born um, when Lamech is born and you count the age of Methuselah, the age of Enoch, the age of Jared, the age of Mahaliel, the age of Cainan, or Canaan's, Cainan, and the age of Enos, 
those add up to 2520. So you don't count Seth's age or Adam's age. So again, it's not something that's very likely, but it's when Lamech is born that we have this going back, adding these ages. It's 2520. So, so I think that's rather interesting. And we have, um, so Iran has put some things here too, dealing with Enoch. Uh, now you have the normal sum is 45 for Enoch. Um, Stephen I'm right, has okay. Yeah, I may, I may be, maybe turn it up wrong. I have but, to check again. But the normal product is two five two zero zero. Okay. Okay. And then sixteen eighteen plus twenty five twenty. What's that? Um, if you just add Adam and Seth, I think you get the sixteen eighteen. If you add what? Adam and Seth, the first two generations. Oh. Something like okay. that. Okay, I see what you're saying. And the significance of 1618? That's a golden ratio. Yeah. So we got the golden ratio, which is 1.618. And the 252, there's 2520. Okay. So, you know, we start to look at these things in detail and we can notice a lot, a lot more. But the thing is, we see they're tied to this 300. Now, the suggestion then is that this 300, well, because we have the arc, is, uh, this is the arc, not the arc in the sanctuary, of course, but the arc that Noah makes is going to be 300 cubits in length a breadth of 50 cubit and a height of 30 cubits. Um, so here we have 300 cubits in length, and this would be a type of, um, well, here I would, you know, Dwight, you said it's kind of a judgment, a symbol of judgment. But here this is something that's a covering or a protection, right? The ark protects them during God's judgment. But wasn't there judgment for the rest of the world when they didn't accept the warning to get on the ark? Yeah, that's true. But I'm, I'm saying, well, there's judgment there. In order to have protection from God's judgment, there has to be judgment. But I'm just saying the 300 cubits themselves, um, to me, would symbolize more God's protection. So it's a message that protects people from God's judgment. Okay. So it is a warning message about God's judgment. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> now, when we look at the next <coughs> verse, here again, we're dealing with Joseph and his brothers. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five chases, changes of raiment. So, yeah, the three and the five. Joseph, yep. Yep, go on. So, we have both the 300 and the five that are here. Yeah. Raiment being symbolized as character mm -hmm. five being symbolized as you know the wise virgins mm -hmm. so you have a covering but we're also seeing at this time 
that this is an invitation for Israel and his household to come to Egypt. And we know what the symbols that we've seen in this with Joseph have been. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we have all of these, these same symbols, the 187, the 252, and everything's tied together. So we see in these major examples of 300, we see all of the symbols related to this movement. And we're also seeing very directly the 22 or the reunion. Yeah, the 22, the restoration symbol. Exactly. Because here again, this is Genesis 45, 22. So we have 45 that relates to the 45 on the 1843 chart. And we have the 22 repeated just as we saw there with Genesis 5.22. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of this has, is speaking to the movement right now. Right. So when we look at the 300 men in Judges and we try to place this, I mean, this is about a warning message, um, in this case to the movement. But we also know that some of this is referring to events still in the future. So the movement needs to give this warning message. Agreed. Right. And so so when we have this symbol of 300, um, it's tied to what already has been given as far as the message is concerned. It's tied to... All of those symbols that we looked at, the 65, the 252, the 187, uh, the 365, uh, the 777. And so so the 300 does represent this movement that gives a warning message. And what we believed is that we gave that warning message at Nashville, and that's what was being described. But we know that this has to refer to something future warning message that's given to the Levites, right? Well, if it's, if it's not given to the Levites, how's it ever going to go out to the world? Right. Now, in, in Judges 8, 4, um, you have Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing them. Now, again, this 300 men is tied to another symbol the crossing of the jordan now it's in right eight verse four which is 84 which is also on the 1843 chart in the seven times 12. right right in the calculation for the 2520. but let's also remember when it's saying that they're crossing the jordan they're crossing the jordan going from west to east, right? Yes. So they are crossing to go against a, a message of Islam or okay. a reaction to Islam. Okay. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be correct? Well, yes, especially in the context of the message of Gideon dealing with the Midianites and uh, the children of the East and the Amalekites, right? All right. So you have all those symbols tied together here in the story of Gideon. But the crossing of the Jordan is also a symbol in and of itself. Because the Jordan River is where baptism of Christ occurred. It's also where they came and entered into the promised land. Right? Going the right. way from east to west, but still, it, it's a symbol. So 300 men crossing the Jordan River um, would also represent a type of baptism.
Right. Now, so uh, then, yeah. No, keep going. Well, I'm just going to the next verse if you have. Uh, sure. Yeah. So the next verse was Judges 11.26. Yeah, so this is going to be of the 300 years, which we take as a period of 300 years in biblical chronology. Um, we don't have it rounded down or up or anything. Now, Ellen White also refers to a period of 300 years, um, and that's when the ark dwelt in Shiloh. Now, the question... And that's in relation to 1 Samuel, right? What's that? That's in relation to 1 Samuel, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so when we have the ark, the 300 years there, Ellen White says 300 years, um, I don't think we can take it as exactly 300 years because I haven't been able to get it to fit with what we have. That's that's one of the points that we're going to have to address um, later on. I don't think we want to look at that part of that chronology right at the moment. Um, but Stephen and I have, you know, worked on the chronology of the judges a bit, and uh, I take the position that 300 years has to be longer. So I have a, a chart of it um, that Ellen White's talking about the time that the ark dwelt in Shiloh, because the other things wouldn't fit. But here we have 300 years, and Ellen White saying 300 years as a symbol, even though it's, it's, it's longer than that. Um, so she would be rounding down in that case, which she tends to do more often than rounding up. But anyway, um, what what would this um this is the the idea here in judges 11 when we looked at it is that they had this opportunity because this is the this has to do with the ephraimites right is it the ephraimites um we go there right so um Um, who was it exactly? Oh, yeah. So this is Sion, king of the Amorites, talking to the Israelites. Because um, this has to do with Jephthah, and I'm just reading through this here quickly. Yeah, so they go to the king of Edom, let us pass through your land. And, and then they want to go through. The Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land un, into this place. But Sihon trusted not Israel to pass through his coasts. But Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched at Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country, and they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites, from Arnon even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? Will thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them he will possess. And now art thou any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? And Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns, and in Aurora and her towns, and in all the cities that be along by the coast of Arnon three hundred years. Why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? Therefore, I have not sinned against thee, but thou hast done me, doest me wrong to war against me. 
The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearkened not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. So what's exactly happened, happening here? All right. So Jephthah sends measures, measures, uh, messengers to the king of the children of Ammon. And he's going to basically... Um, What's the discussion here? Does, do people remember? How could we characterize this without, without going into too much detail, just a summary of it? As I recall, we had quite a study in this area. Yeah. I'm just trying to recall all of the different points that we brought out. Right. So what, what's their disagreement? So Jephthah was being rejected by his father's house. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now but then they come to him. Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, just go on. But they come to him later because they need a leader, and they yeah. didn't feel capable of leading themselves. Right. So they make Jephthah the leader. Right. Yeah. So they're going to be fleeing here. <clears throat> at the beginning of this chapter right and then the the, so we've got the the elders of gilead go and get jephthah right and they they want to make him captive captain right so we know right. that's jephthah <clears throat> So in chapter 11, in Judges 11, 11, they make him the head and captain. So we have that 11, 11 symbol. Right. And then it's then that Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, because those are the ones that are oppressing them. But and saying, why are you coming to this need of fire? Yeah. By 1117, he's also sending messengers to the king of Edom. Right. So he sends them to the king of Adam, uh, um, Ammon, and then to Edom. And here he wants to pass through the land, but the king of Edom's not going to allow him to pass through the land. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because they go Ammon, Edom. And he sends a similar message to the king of Moab, yeah. but the king of Moab would not consent. Yeah. Yeah, so we have Edom, Moab, and Ammon, right, which is mentioned in Daniel 11, verse 41. Right. And then he's going to send messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites. And that's where we're going to have this uh, discussion. So Sihon doesn't trust Israel. And it says, And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all of his people into the hand of Israel. And they possess all the coasts. Um, So in verse 23, here, I'm going to go look at these verses here so, so you can see them. This is where I'm, I'm not clear on, on who's speaking. Right, so if you go back to verse 21, the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, 
and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country, and they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites, so that's the borders, from Arnon even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it. So who's speaking here? Is this, like I have a hard time following this. This is uh, Jephthah speaking to. Okay, so that's okay. Jephthah. Speaking to the Ammonites. Okay. Uh, will thou possess? So where does he start speaking to the king of the? Where does he start this, this speaking? Is this going to be um, the king of the Ammonites to, of Ammon? So is this all of this Jephthah speaking? So he's talking about the past? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's rehearsing the past. And then you're going to have all these things that he says. Um, so when it's, while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and Aurora and her towns, in all the cities that be along by coasts of Arnon, 300 years, why therefore did you not recover them within that time? That's Jephthah speaking to the king of Ammon. Yes. Okay, so that makes more sense now. Because I wasn't clear who was speaking. So he's saying you had this opportunity during this 300 years. And so that 300 years you count from seven years after the crossing of the Jordan? No. Where? Um, one year before. Oh, from one year before the crossing of the Jordan? Yes. Okay. And then I count the se seven years then, I would count, oh, sorry, seven years later, I would count the other 300 for the tabernacle being set up in Shiloh. Oh, okay. So that's how you do it. And the problem there would be that it doesn't fit in. Ellen White's 300 years can't be an exact number of 300 years. Well, I don't know. It's, um, we just have things overlap. You know, you, you'd yeah, have well, some, you know, Eli being the same time as, around the same time as Jephthah. Yeah, but then you still have the issue with Samson and you have the different ages of of Samuel and so forth. So trying to fit that whole thing together, um, it doesn't make sense to put Samuel 300 years, literally, like exactly. Um, and, and we're going to have to somehow uh, work this out um, so that we can we can look at it together. Well, well Samuel, he would be a contemporary. Samson. Yeah, well, see, I have 369 years from Shiloh to uh, that the Ark would be in Shiloh. How do you do that? <clears throat> um, because I count um, uh, the seven months, the 20 years, um, and coming up to Saul. So I have from when the ark leaves Shiloh to when Saul is anointed king is basically 21 years. So, so we're going to have to look at that. We're going to have to try to figure this out. Um, but that's how I read the, uh, the verses dealing with Samuel's 20 years. Well, some them 20 years is um, the time after the uh, the Philistines are still oppressing Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and then Samuel, El might say Samuel was invested as a judge after them 20 years. 
after the 20 years? Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so. Yeah, so then he's going to continue on for for quite some time, I think, before he, he's really old then, before he, because uh, he, he would still be quite young, because he was maybe only like 15 or so when that arc was taken. And then you have them 20 years, so Samuel would have been 35. And yeah. He tells it. He continued until he was very old, El Knight says. So okay. he, it'll be uh, quite some time after that. Okay, so we're going to have to hammer that out in detail at some point. And, and I'm, I'm not ready to do that in the sense that I, I, I still have to go over your notes and go over it, and then we can sort of figure it out. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to put it... Um, so you're saying that he's going to be 35 years old um, in 1166 BC, and there's going to be 69 years before Saul is anointed. That would make Samuel um, what, 104 years old when Saul is anointed. Is that what we All right. Probably. Yeah, so that's pretty old. He is old, yeah. And he was and Samuel's going to just, um, now he's also going to anoint David. That's right. And how old is, how long had been Saul reigning when David is anointed? Um, well, so David is born. When he is, uh, when Saul has been reigning 10 years. Yeah, so you're going to have to have Samuel be like 130 or something. Yes, well, when he, he dies around that age. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, well, you had, well, you had, you had the likes of Jehoiada, Jehoiada around the time of Joash, so he left at 130 or so, so okay. he was out there. It's yeah. definitely possible. Okay. It is. Yeah. Okay, so it's something we're going to have to work out so everyone can see it quite clearly. Mm -hmm. So they, they were already saying that Samuel was quite old when he uh, sort of gave his sons yeah. to be priests, but he's going to live, you know, maybe another... Um, 30 years or so after that. <coughs> yeah. After that. Yeah. 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 He was already old. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we, so we'll work that out so everyone can see it quite clearly. Um, now, so we have, and here we're looking at the symbol of the 300 years. So the 300 years then, um, we have these two periods of 300 years, Alan White's period and this period. So if they are literally 300 years, uh, they serve as symbols, even if they literally aren't literally. They serve as symbols of what? what? How would we tie these symbols to what we already have with the 300 men of Gideon? Because 300 years, the ark's in Shiloh. And 300 years that the Ammonites had an opportunity to recover these cities that were lost to the Israelites. So what are these symbols then? What had we discussed cities as representing? Um, I don't know. I mean, cities can represent lots of things. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, the question that's being asked, while well, Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aurora and her towns and in all the cities that be along the coast of Arnon for 300 years, why yeah. therefore did you not recover them within that time? So right. he, they're asking, they're asking the question to the Midianites, right? Oh, this is uh, Jephthah asking the question to the king of Ammon, to the Ammonites. Okay. So why haven't the Ammonites come back to recover these towns? Right? Yeah, because they're making an argument, well, you know, this is sort of our territory. Uh, you took land from us, and they, he's basically saying, well, you didn't come and try to get it back. <coughs> why, are, you know, why are you doing it now sort of thing, I guess. Right. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think they actually uh, had that land. Any, anyway, that was the Amorites' land. Yeah. On the air. So it was never really their land anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't really their land. They had an opportunity to take it before, and they're they're kind of questioning why the Israelites uh, are are going to be uh, taking that land. I mean, I'm not sure I fully understand the argument, what kind of argument they're making. It's sort of a little bit uh, obscure to me. But, but he is referring back to the fact that these towns had been in possession of the Israelites for 300 years. So as a symbol, I, I don't know, you know how we're going to interpret this as a symbol, these 300 years. We have the 300 years of the Ark in Shiloh. Um, and, and they seem to be tied together, these two periods of 300 years. But we now have to connect him to the story of Gideon, his 300 men. So these 300 years are representing what? I mean, the Ark being in Shiloh. So the Ark is in Shiloh temporarily, right? It's not in the place where God ultimately wants it to be. Dwight? Yeah, I'm listening. I just heard you. I said right. Oh, right. Okay. But I'm just not satisfied that we've we've really given a symbol for what these 300 years are. I mean, we can see the number 300, and we can see them tied to this this history. Um, okay, if we're going to take it in our time, and we're taking this, this history, this 300 years would have to reach back if we're going to apply it. It would have to reach back to 9-11. Okay, correct. To something like that. And so this is a message that has been developing since 9-11. But we also have um, this argument against the enemy, their message that is oppressing us. So Jephthah is a judge, and he's a message. And his message to the this group that is oppressing us, this message that's oppressing us, And, and we take um, this message that's doing this oppressing as a symbol of a 
of what? What is this message? Are we asking if this is a message from Jephthah or is this a message from the Amorites? It's a message from Jephthah. It's about the Amor Ammonites. So would this be a message of method of study? Mm. Well, no. Okay, so 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 we're, let's we're jumping around a little bit here. So I want to go back to judges uh, dealing with Gideon, right? So with Gideon, okay. the enemy is the Midianites that oppressed them for seven years. Right. Okay, and so we have this three hundred attached to this message. Now we said that Midian is strife. And it opens up the way for the children of the East and for the Amalekites. Now, so we're looking at Judges 11, where it's talking about the Ammonites. And so it also has 300 attached to it. Right. So we're looking at this <clears throat> 300. But when we look at it in the story of, of Gideon, we see that this is a message of... Um, it, it's it's a message that addresses specifically the the strife aspect, right? So we're whittled down to these three hundred, right? In Judges chapter seven, and it's these three hundred that are going to give this message. So they're going to give a message that's going to defeat the Midianites. So, so we have this other story that also has 300, but it talks about 300 years. And so what I'm saying is that the 300, the message of the 300, deals with a message that goes back to the past. It ties us to our whole history, um, at least since 9-11. Because we have to take all of these 300s and, and we can see that they apply to this message, to the symbols of this message. So here in Judges chapter 11, this reference to the 300 is a reference to the same thing. But it's, it's not dealing with the same enemy here. It's talking about something in the past. Right. Right. It's talking about this Agreed. whole in which they had this opportunity. And Jephthah is giving a message, because it is a message, to those who have not, not accomplished what they said they wanted to accomplish. So that's the enemy, the Ammonites. So the Ammonites is this other message. So when, when we get there, we can look at this in more detail of what that is. But we, we already have, have addressed it before. And this would have to be the message, the counterfeit message uh, that we have regarding um, the Trump prediction, right, and also the pandemic. So that's what I believe we understood it to be. <clears throat> so when we look at the next uh, example, we're going to be now in the new, um, in well, we're going to have the story of Judges again, chapter 15. And that's going to be Samson with the 300 foxes. So again, we're going to have that, this repeated 300 again. So we have 300 in the story of Gideon. We have 300 in the story of Jephthah. We have 300 mentioned in the story of Samson. Now here he catches 300 foxes. And turns them tail to tail, which we would say is right. a structure, which is a chiasm. And he puts a firebrand in the midst, right? So you have these two tails, a doubly, right? And you have this turning point, right? This 
center point. Now, I'm not sure how, how we understand what he's exactly doing. So he turns tail to tail and he puts a firebrand in the midst between two tails. So what, what do we picture? I mean, I, I don't think we address that fully when we were studying that. Uh, but would he have just, like he's going to start their tails on fire, right? Well, it says that he put a firebrand, he put a torch in yeah. the midst between the two tails. Yeah, but how? what is he doing? Is he tying it to the two tails, or is he just lighting the two tails on fire? It, it's To me, it's rather obscure exactly what he's doing. I mean, I can't see foxes um, being tied together. And it says turned tail to tail. This would be, to me, that they're pointing in the opposite direction. Right. So I, I see him as starting these these foxes' tails on fire, but he's going to start. He's going to have them turn tail to tail when he starts their tail on fire. So he's lighting two foxes at the same time, and then these, of course, are going to run through the fields and cause the fields to burn. And exactly, you know, how long it takes him to do this, and the whole process—it's not explained. But we have these symbols here. So we can take uh, 300 foxes, which is a symbol that we have three being attached to. If you look at um, Genesis chapter 15 with the animal, the carcasses that are cut, <coughs> cut in half that are three years old. So you have a th symbol three there and a chiasm. And there you're going to have a... Um, a smoking fire and a burning lamp that are going to pass between um, the carcasses. Well, here we have a firebrand in the midst of these two tails between these two foxes. So again, to me, it'd just be an illustration of a structural chiasm. Being um, 300, so the grip, there's two in each. So that would be 150 mm -hmm. doubles, you know, two groups of uh, foxes. Yeah. So as, to me, I just, I'm thinking about the Islam prophecy of the 150 years. Okay. And, um, and uh, I think there was an, uh, uh, an Ezekiel talks about uh, foxes relating to false prophets. Yeah. And so we could maybe think of Ish Islam and okay. Muhammad and so forth there. And uh, the, the prophet is the teal, the, the false prophet is the teal, I think, as well. It says yeah. that in there. Yeah. So I don't know, just, just some thoughts. Yeah. So the prophet that telleth lies, he is the tail. Right? That's the verse you're thinking of. Yeah. So, yeah. so we have, yeah, so we have foxes tied to the idea of a false prophet and um, we have um, tail tied to the idea of a false prophet. We have the 150, two periods of 150 years. And, and so I would say that this 300 Foxes. This isn't a. Um, it's a, it's a message that exposes the the false prophet and burns down the, their fields, which has to do with the grain and so forth, the false teachings. So, would we say that the, it's these structural chiasms that are answering? Um, and this is in the story of Samson, but we, we have them in, in the other stories too. We have the 300 in each of these stories. That this is representing true prophecy 
opposing false prophecy. Yeah, and the I spots. think that's worthy of consideration. Yeah. Now, here's the way that I look at it. Now, you know, when I see, and, and I'm not calling, you know, Colin or Odilio false prophets, because I don't think this is referring to people here. This has to do with aspects of a message. But we have uh, two things, the Trump prediction and the pandemic. And in each of these, we have, in our studies, have come to see that these, these are typical. <clears throat> that is, Trump's prediction fulfilled its role in the typical line that we are in. And the pandemic fulfilled its role in the typical line that we are in as the Sunday law. In order to see that, in order to be able to discern what's correct and what's not correct about the interpretation of that, we have been given all of these dates, all of these structures. Now, in both Collins and Odilio's, they have structures that are correct. The only problem is the interpretation that's placed upon those structures. That is, when I see Collins lines, it fits exactly with what I understand. But then he ignores all of the other things because he hasn't studied them that we have understood. Same with Odilio. He lays out these lines correctly. The dates are correct. Spans of time and the symbols are correct. But in both cases, those chronologies don't support the conclusions that they're coming to. There's nothing that supports the idea in their chronologies that this pandemic is turning into the Sunday law and that the Sunday law is going to be connected to the vaccinations and we're going to just move right into the Sunday law. There's nothing that supports the idea that Trump is going to be made present again, president again and be the one that brings about this Sunday law. The structures themselves don't give you that information. Now, when, but also we have to ignore all of the other ways in which these structures are tied to, to our lines. And in both of those cases, they're taken out of that, that context so that we can't see that they don't support the conclusions that are being drawn from them. And so these messages in the, of themselves need to be turned tail to tail. And when we do that, to me, what we're doing is we're placing them into this structure. And that structure includes, you know, April 5th, 2030, right? It's tied to Collins directly. Odilio's is tied to all of the other structures that we have. So, so in this, this, this story of Samson, we have this test, but it's dealing with these 300. So this 300 is about a message, but there is a true message addressing the 300, and there is a message of the 300 that's represented by foxes that need to be turned tail to tail. So this 300 is a, a consistent symbol, but in each of these stories, it serves a different role. Would that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. So then, so then 300 is a symbol of a warning message. But you can have a true warning message or a false one. There's so many times that, that this message comes up that it 
it gives a symbol of this warning message that precedes a shut door. So it's a preparatory message, one that has to be given its proper weight. It's one that on which we need to pay attention. Because when when we begin to see this for what it really is, we begin to understand the seriousness of the time that we're in. Mm -hmm. Now, now, when you talk about the shut door, so, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always a little leery about talking about shut doors. I mean, I understand the doors shut and that messages uh, bring per, a person to a point of decision. Uh, but to me, shut doors are very specific things that have to have a lot of things attached to them. But we know that there That's are many shut doors. Yeah. It's why I use the adjective preparatory to. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but one of the things we saw with Odilio's presentation dealing with the mandates um, is that he jumped from the mandates and addressed it, addressed the Trump prediction of Colin. And, and he made it quite clear, at least in my mind, you know, maybe he, he could qualify it. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm taking his words wrong. But basically that this is a testing message and that those that don't accept the Trump prediction of Colin, that they're closing their probation and they can't wait. They can't just wait to see if it happens. They're making their decision prior to it. So, you know, maybe I misunderstood him and what he was saying. But I'm always leery about attaching um, a close of probation to some kind of date, some kind of message that if you don't accept this message now, your probation is going to close here, right? That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah, that would be Omega. Omega. Mega did the same thing. Right. So we saw that, that same thing with November 9th. Now, part of what they were doing, and even people that weren't part of the Omega that still stayed, is they were thinking that November 9th was going to make us righteous. So, you know, if we could, if we can maintain a perfect righteousness prior to November 9th, once we got there, we would be sealed and we would never have to worry about sinning again. Right. And, and I warned about that maybe not as directly as I should have, but when I presented at the camp meeting in 2018, um, I addressed this whole issue of the close of probation and what November 9th didn't mean. And it definitely did not mean Daniel uh, 12 verse one. And, and it wouldn't be, let him that is righteous be righteous still. But so that's not the point that I'm trying to make. No, I know, I realize that. I was just going to say that you're not trying to to make that point. But all I'm saying is that you're talking about the close of probation, but still many people are looking for events to bring about that situation. And for the 144,000, when they're declared righteous, they don't even know that they've been declared righteous. Right. They're not they're they're not all of a sudden seeing themselves as righteous. In fact, quite the opposite. And they're going to be driven to see themselves in the worst possible state imaginable because they understand their nature. So closes of probation will happen. People are going to close their probation every time you're exposed to light and you reject light. You're moving closer and closer to closing your probation and being shut out from God. But that close of probation is, is not something that can be seen or marked because it tends to be an individual uh, event. Now, it is true on a line you can have something that symbolizes a close of probation in type. But I would never take it literally that it applies to every person, even November 9th. Um, I wouldn't argue that every person who ended up on Parminder's side has now their probation closed and can never repent. 
I don't believe that that's the case because it depends how much light they personally had. And God still would be laboring with many of them who are in that condition. There would be some who have closed their probation. I don't believe that Tess and Parminder, and I'm not the judge, but I don't believe it's possible that they're going to be uh, converted to the truth. They would have too much light and have gone too far to be persuaded by the evidences that God is going to give. They've developed a character that would be unable to see themselves as sinners. <clears throat> now, um, so moving on for more of these symbols, we have um, the weight of a spear, 300 shekels of brass in weight. Um, we have... Um, uh, another spear um, here, that, but he says he lifted up his spear against 300, so 300 men that are killed. So, so the interesting thing here is we have 300 shekels of brass for a spear, right? And then we have a spear lifted up that kills 300 men. Unrelated stories, but it's kind of interesting that we have this 300 attached to a spear. So the question is, what is a spear? Well, we recognize it as being a pointed implement, literally. So what do we recognize it as being figuratively? Well, I would say it's a line. Okay, so now, here again, we have this in this book dealing with the, the 300 shekels on the spear. Mm -hmm. This is giving reference to Yishbinab, mm -hmm. which was of the sons of the giant. Yeah. So his dwelling is in Nob, and why is that important for us to note? Um, okay, just hang on here. Um, I don't know. Do you have an answer? I'm I'm puzzling that right now. Yeah, because his name means his dwelling is in Nob. Now, technically, Ish uh, refers to the idea of a um, uh, a man, right? So Ish is like a husband or whatever, a man. Um, and then you have the word Nob and Yeshab. So I'm not sure if I'm okay, but, clear. That's the way. So they're interpreting this differently than I would, because they're going yeshab, yish, binab. I'm not sure how they're constructing that word. Uh, okay, but here. Anyway, the way the way that that's there is dwelling is in nob, and nob means fruit. Mm-hmm. What else should we be seeing here? Yeah, I don't know if I agree that the word knob is there. So I see this as two different words, yishbo and binab. Um, now it could be binab here is like the sons of knob. Um, um, but... Um, 
Yeah, so Yushbo. Yeah, I'm not really sure about his name, exactly what it means. Okay. But I, I don't know. I think we, we could look too much into some of these things here in the sense that, I mean, that's in the context of another story. But when we deal with the 300 shekels itself, the weight of this spear, um, you know, a spear is a line. So I'm just saying this right. spear being attached to this 300 shekels would represent a message that is drawn on a line. And, and, and we do that often too, you know, and when I draw my lines, sometimes I draw them as an arrow. I have a, I'm showing that they're going into the future. So I have put an arrow at the end, you know, time flies like an arrow. <clears throat> okay. But here, here you've got, if we're, if we're going to make that application, then the spear being drawn on a line, is this a spear of brass? And is, is brass the metal of captivity? Or how, how do we play it? Well, it's a metal of judgment, of, of God withdrawing his mercy. So again, if this is a medal of judgment, then is this not another type of, or is this not another symbol of a shut door? God withdrawing his mercy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's pointing to it. Right. Yeah, okay. And then you're going to have the, he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them. Right, so you're going to have this Ishbashai, Abishai, the brother of Joab, who. Abishai, yes. This, what's that? Abishai. Abishai, okay. He lifted up his spear against 300, so he's going to kill 300. So again, we have the spear attached to this 300. <clears throat> So the 300, okay. uh, the, the spear can be 300 shekels of brass, but the spear can also uh, slay 300. So again, we see this 300, but it's in different contexts. But it still is a consistent symbol in and of itself. So, okay, so here is Abishai, the brother of Joab. Mm -hmm. the son of Zeruiah, but Abishai is the father of a gift mm -hmm. and is the brother of the, he that is Jehovah fathered. Mm -hmm. And he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them and had the name among the three. So is not Abishai, um, would, wouldn't that be like a, a cousin or a nephew of David? Well, some kind of relative. Because isn't Jeruiah David's sister? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure of all these relations. They, they sometimes become, become kind of obscure in the language of uh, Hebrew and how people are related, but... Um, okay. But as we look at this, Abishai is one that, that slew 300 men. Yeah. So, <coughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so Zeruiah, which means balsam, she's a sister of David and a mother of the three leading heroes of David's army, Abishai, Joab, and Asael. So if this if this is a son of Jeruiah, a son of David's sister, that means that these are his nephews. Yeah, I'm just yeah, all I'm saying is that in Hebrew, saying that somebody's a sister doesn't show you exactly completely the relationship. Okay. That's all I'm saying. You know, so they use these terms that in English are more specific, they use them more loosely. Okay. Right. So all I'm saying is from right. based on this, it, it's probably right. Yeah, they would be nephews. And, and that could be okay. the case. But I'm just saying from, from now, the heat itself, I don't know. Okay. Now we've come through the first half of this paper. Yeah. And we're at the, at the close of our time together today. Mm-hmm. We still have a lot to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's still more to look at. So, so we'll do this tomorrow. Do we have Do we have any other questions or comments with what we've been addressing? Okay, so shall we then close this meeting? Yeah, okay. Well, we will close it. Right. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful uh, for the study today. Uh, we pray, Lord, for each person who's been studying these things. You know the trials that you continue to give us, um, difficulties that we have to face that are showing us our character defects. And But I pray, Lord, that you can have your angels watch over us and keep us. Help us, Lord, to cling to you. Help us to understand the time that we are living in and the seriousness of what we think and understand about the scriptures. Help us to be faithful to the light we have and to be a light to those around us. Be with us now through this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.